Good evening, and a very, very warm welcome to all of you, uh, both on Zoom and um, on live stream. Welcome to this Friends of Europe online In Conversation With series, which we've been holding regularly. Uh, on this occasion, this on online In Conversation With series is part of how, what we call our uh, annual um, global uh, brainstorm on the state of Europe, on the future of Europe. This will feed into that conversation that will happen in the autumn, or in October. Um, on this occasion, uh, we are going to be talking about recovery, resilience and research. What's the role of research, R&D, innovation in this context that we find ourselves? I'm really very pleased that we have Maria Gabriel, the commissioner responsible for our huge portfolio. Uh, someone who doesn't need a lot of introduction, like most commissioners, but she's someone who biggest tsunami on our societal and economic context that we've ever experienced. And it's shuddered everybody and created, as people have commented often, a new normal. What we do know, what we do know, is that research and innovation, and in particular, what the, the spend on it, has a huge impact on future economic growth. It's interesting that combined, the EU's um, comparison between what it spent on research and innovation in, uh, as, a, as a percentage of its uh, GDP is much lower than South Korea, Japan, the States, and others. So go figure, why are those economies doing much better, especially in the context of where we find ourselves? So do we need to be thinking di differently about the role of uh, research and innovation as we come out of this situation, but also perhaps rather than reinvent, transform Europe? What we also know, another interesting important fact, is that about 20, just over 20% of Europe's population is under 29. It's that generation or those generations that are going to be part of our future success story and economic growth. They will need to have the capacity to bounce back, but have the, I suppose, the economic and social steroids to help them survive, but also thrive. So on that note, it gives me great pleasure to invite Maria uh, to this In Conversation with. Maria, thank you for joining us today. Welcome. Can you hear me? You're going to have to unmute. Thank you. That's great. Um, I want to, before we go into kind of looking at the, uh, the innards of your portfolio and the key questions that this huge audience that we've got both on, on Zoom but also on live stream that will ask you a number of questions. I want to go, I suppose, personal uh, in terms of really thinking about the fact that it has been a tsunami in so many ways, right? Uh, and leadership has been challenged so significantly on various fronts. You're a, a woman with a very significant portfolio, and you are someone that have, has had to manage a number of areas that are critical to how we manage now, but as we move forward. What's been the leadership challenge or learning for you, if you can share with us, um, of the impact of the COVID crisis for you? Well, uh, for me, when, when we talk about uh, leadership, it's quite important to have a, a leader and it's, uh, it's a huge satisfaction to work as, with a strong leader like our president at the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. And after leadership, for me, it's uh, about how we can serve noble causes. And this crisis has shown us exactly that, that research, innovation, education and culture it's one of the most noble causes for the benefits of the society. So that's why during the crisis, I must, I must admit that we just rediscover their spirit, their force, and their future proof orientation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm sure there might be other questions around that, but it's good to, thank you for uh, responding well to what might appear to be quite a personal question. But I just think it's important to uh, get under the skin of politics sometimes and leaders uh, and make this, because it's been such a human story for all of us and we've connected in ways which we never imagined uh, on our streets and through our windows. So anyway, now move, moving forward, um, one of the uh, issues in this context that everyone will be concerned about this is, is there a trade-off between investment in recovery and innovation. And given the march to create uh, a solution or a vaccination, um, how do you speed up the process of a, a common European research area, which has been, whilst the infrastructure for research, right, has been really significant for Europe, and it shows that it's paid off, we don't have a framework that's coherent and consistent and aligned. So 
Is there a trade-off? And can this accelerate the, the European research area? Maria, over to you. No, there is no, no trade-off. What is important now is to recognize the role of research and innovation. And I must, I must say at the beginning that uh, I would like to start with the role of science because mm. what, what you all we have seen that today we need science more than ever. Uh, only by developing effective uh, and safe vaccines and treatments, we can win this fight against the virus. And that's why I'm quite proud because in this in this crisis in the in the in the fields of research and innovation, uh, as a European Commission, we were fast and our actions uh, were decisive. First, allow me just to to remind you that our first emergency uh, research uh, call uh, it was in the end of January. So that means that since the end of January, there is now 18 projects. Uh, with 151 research teams, they are working intensively mm -hmm. on three main aspects, vaccine treatments and diagnostic tests. And that's not, that's not all, definitely. Because immediately after that was quite successful, our call with the European Innovation Council, in March, we launched the call at a European hackathon that was done uh, before the 24th and 26th of April under my patronage. We, we received uh, more than 2,000 proposals for solutions and people that registered were 21,000. Amazing. That means that when we work together, when we would like really to show our solidarity with the other, when we use the creativity and the innovative ideas, we can really achieve, achieve a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not all because on the other side, for me, that was very important that 10, 10 days ago, we already launched our European data platform. European data platform in order to bring our researchers together to exchange results and data in real times. And that's part of our era versus Corona action plan that was agreed with ministers of, of research in April. And only, only two weeks later, we already delivered on one of the first 10 actions adopted by the, by the ministers. So for me, what we already have shown during this crisis that research and innovation in Europe, we can cooperate, we can coordinate our actions, investments were done, but now much more is needed. That's why um, I would like to underline that it will be not definitely enough to work only at European level. It will be quite, quite important to continue our efforts and to work globally. That's why the pledging conference that, mm. that was launched this Monday, the global pledging conference, it's a, it's, a, it's a very positive signal because allow me just to remind you, the initial amount of money that, uh, that was our wish at least to receive pledges, that was 7.5 billion euros. And during three hours only, we received pledges from worldwide for 7.5, uh, four. It's great, but now we need to scale, to speed, and to express our solidarity. That means to identify the most promising companies, to scale, to think about manufacturing capacities and to go to distribution, and to express our solidarity with not repeating the, 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 some previous errors. This time, the access, Will, will be equitable. <clears throat> Universal access for all member states, for all countries in the world, for all our citizens. So I think that in, in that field, we definitely uh, have shown how we can, we can be critical yeah. to, to make our society more resilient. And at the same time, really to give signals to important parts of our economy. Here I'm thinking, especially on our SMEs, that thanks to the innovation, thanks to research, we can really continue uh, to fight and to, to have to overcome some of the challenges. And that's that's not all, because uh, allow me uh, again here to, to say that on one side in my portfolio, I have research innovation, mm. but on the other, I have education and culture. Indeed. And first, the question is, can can some can someone of us imagine this crisis without distance learning, without the access to online content created by our artists, I think that the situation will be not the same. That's why I would like really to thank them. First, when they talk about education, to thank teachers, 
parents and pupils because they, they, they were mobilized at the beginning. They have shown us how important it is to have digital skills. That's why I'm very glad that uh, later this year I will present the updated version of the Digital Education Action Plan, definitely. Okay. Today it's a huge challenge for all of us. Of course, we have, we have difficulties yeah. on equipment, on connectivity, on trainings for teachers and pupils. We need really now to take some actions on this. But at the same time, I created a platform where member states can exchange some practices. We can learn each from other. And I think that it's the best way. The same for culture, because that's that's really my my strong signal to, mm. to the sector. Mm. They are one of the most severely heated by the crisis. Indeed. 95% yep. of them are self-employed and independent or micro-enterprises. That's right, yep. Now, we already put in place some concrete tools, but definitely there is a need for much more. On one side, there is three horizontal instruments at their disposal. It's our Corona Response Investment Initiative, it's our SURE tool with 100 billion, and it's our stated rules. My, my plea and my demand every day is really that our member states should use them now. That's yeah. why we created a platform where member states can see how they are using different funds, different instruments in order to help the sector. On the other side, in parallel, we, we already think that we, we have shown the maximum of flexibility on Creative Europe. Uh, we already extended the deadlines for a lot of calls. We accelerated the procedures for some of them, especially from, for cross-border projects. We decided together with Commissioner Breton to have 5 million uh, for vouchers for cinemas. But now, since this, this week, what is important, yeah. that that was a proposal of mine to create a platform for the sector, by the sector. And the first signals are quite positive because yeah. we created a platform where yeah. the representatives of creative and cultural sectors, they can propose their own solutions. So I think that for the moment, what we can see that the mobilization was huge. Mm -hmm. And even before, for me, for a lot of people, for this community of the research, innovation, education and culture, it was obvious the added value of these fields for the society, the economy. But, but this crisis really has shown us how they are critical if you'd like to have a strong recovery plan, if, you have, if you'd like to build more resilient society. So that's, that's, my, that's my, my message that today uh, we are now in a new period uh, during, during which we already can see that countries are gradually lifting up some lockdown measures. And in this post-coronavirus society, research and innovation, education and culture will be key, mm. will be key to ensure a sustainable and inclusive recovery because at the same time, you would like to boost our competitiveness and to see how we can adapt and especially equip people with the necessary tools for the transformation of our socioeconomic system. And in this context, no surprise for me, it will be quite important to see that in the next budget of the European Union, the place of research, innovation, yes. education in culture will be reinforced. Mm. And my, my, my wish here is that we should not do what was done in previous economic crises, mm -hmm. where investment in these sectors were just an adjustment to square public and private accounts. That's why I said at the beginning, there is no trade-off between research, recovery and investment in research, innovation and education. So final final message, because I think that it's time now for me Indeed. to stop and to give I, the floor. Yes, yes. Uh, let us recognize the research, innovation, education and, and culture role, that they are key strategic investments if you'd like really to achieve our long-term societal objectives. Maria, thank you very much. You'll forgive a lot of people who are hearing you, right? Well, the, the public narrative that you are, uh, comment, you, you are displaying and evidencing is very different to the public narrative around the lack of solidarity, the lack of agility. And you've demonstrated that despite the size of the institution, you've moved quickly. 
Uh, and I hope you can sustain the agility as you move forward outside of a crisis. That's going to be key, I think, for people, because you've done a hackathon, you've done a global donors, you've almost filled through the actions of yourself and um, Ursula van der Leyen, created a kind of a, an opportunity for Europe to be more global in shaping some of the responses. So I think that's it's really important. But, and I think that what you said about to our, our, our colleagues who are probably in, in the audience around from the cultural sector, education sector, music to their ears, but about what that manifests itself in terms of reality and speed is gonna be key. And we also know the impact is uneven. So when you talk about online education, we know there are big parts of Europe poorer parts of Europe where children are going without the online space. And we need to be thinking about those, otherwise our social mobility outside as we move out of this is going to grow even wider. So these things that I want you to, would like you to think about and ponder, but I want to bring in first, before I bring in our Zoom audience and those on live stream, our Debating Europe platform. So we have a Debating Europe platform with over 5 million users who engage on a weekly basis around issues that matter to them and matter to Europe, about Europe's current and future uh, 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 div development and trajectory. So we I want to invite Caroline from our Debating Europe platform who has, I think, believe, two s questions from two citizens uh, right now. So Caroline, where are you? Lovely, welcome, uh, Caroline. Hello, Damendra, and hello. good evening, uh, Commissioner. Um, good evening, Caroline. <laughs> thank you. Um, Yes, so um, as Damendra said, I'm representing Debating Europe uh, tonight, Friends of Europe's citizens platform. We had a question sent in by a member of our community. His name is Matt and he's from the UK. And he wants to know how far we are still away from a vaccine against COVID-19. And he asks, how is the EU supporting COVID-19 research in Europe? And can you take the second question as well so we can have uh, both at the same time? Okay, I can do that. Um, our second question is from a user called Sokol from um, Albania, who is convinced that science should always go forward rather than banning or regulating it. Do you think that we will have to loosen European regulation on medical research when it comes to fighting COVID-19? Okay, thank you, Caroline. So Maria, two chunky questions. Thank you for that. Two chunky questions. So how far we are from vaccines? For me, two main aspects. Uh, first, yes, in normal time, uh, that takes years to develop a vaccine. Because what is important for a vaccine is to be safe and to be efficient. And for us, it's no way to make compromise with this. That's why we need now to accelerate and to invest. I'm quite encouraged because in normal time, that takes years to pass from the preclinical to clinical trials. What we have seen during this crisis, that in only three, four months, we have two European companies that already announced that they will start their clinical trials with the first 200 people in June. That's amazing. Second thing, allow me here to introduce a little bit technical issue, but since the month of March, March, our high performance computing centers are working on this. Mm -hmm. And they allow us really to, to go very quickly because they can really verify in one week thousands and thousands of scenarios. So I think that what is important now is to coordinate and to cooperate. That was that's why it was so important to have this this European data platform in order to exchange results. Okay. And that's why now the Global Response Initiative is important because there will be a partnership on vaccines and these partnerships will, partnership will be useful for three things, scale, speed, solidarity. Second thing, allow me maybe here to say that maybe we should stop to, to talk about vaccine and we should talk about vaccines. Mm, exactly. Because we, we need we need to take into consideration different temperatures, different climate conditions, different categories of populations. Mm. Elderly people are not children. So I, that's why I think that what can seem as fragmentation at an enormous landscape, yeah. that's our force yeah. and strength as Europe, because actually, thanks to this partnership, thanks to our Era versus Corona Action Plan, we'll have more clear picture. What okay. are the most promising? To invest in them and to speed the development. 
second, and that's my second. My my that's about the second question. As I already said, we are talking here about people's life. That's why some of the aspects links to the regulation, mm -hmm. especially when we we touch this field of medical research, is quite important. The example of vaccine again, because. We'll develop a vaccine. I stay quite confident that by the end of the year we'll have a vaccine. But after, what is the next phase? We need a strong work with national authorities. There is ethical committees. Okay. There is a work with the European Agency of Medicines. Can we make a compromise with this? No. For me, definitely no. We need to have okay. this this strong criteria because it's about people's life because the secondary effects can be very 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 dangerous so that's why just before this this meeting i participated in a meeting together with commissioner kiriakides with health ministers mm -hmm. and i proposed them to create a european wide clinical trials network in order to have a clear picture and definitely our intention it's not to create additional burden our intention is to facilitate to stay really firm on, on the principles, on the efficiency and safety, but at the same time to give us chances to, to build some additional manufacturing capacities. And when we talk about distribution, to continue to put uh, the added value of our European approach, universal access, access for all. Thank you, Maria. And I just hope that um, your entrepreneurial zeal isn't tampered as we move out of this, because I think we'll need that. The, all the examples you've given is very entrepreneurial. And as one of our European Young Leaders, for Friends of Europe, it's obvious that you are uh, of that ilk of uh, en the enterprising zeal. Colleagues who are on Zoom, um, and uh, um, can I just say, thank you for being patient. What I'd like you to do is use your virtual hand which I hope you've found by now, to raise a question. It's the only way we'll be able to manage this. So raise your virtual hand if, if you'd like to ask a question um, and you, uh, basically chat as a result of, of this process. So use your virtual hand uh, and then we'll take you in order. Those of you on live stream can use Twitter to pose a question, which we'll also be able to monitor and engage with. So there we are. Whilst you are listening, please do put yourself on mute. When I ask you, please do unmute yourself. So those are the kind of rules of the game, if you like. So first and foremost, we have someone already, and it's Andre. Andre Lusker, who is one of your peers, a uh, European young leader uh, of old. If you hope you don't mind saying that, Andre. Where are you, Andre? I'm in Paris. Hello. Do hello. I please, nice to see you. Please do introduce yourself. Yes, hello, Commissioner Gabriel. Nice to see you again. I'm uh, running the Joint European Disruptive Initiative, which you, which you probably know, and we just launched a COVID-19 uh, uh, challenge. Uh, by the way, using the European uh, supercomputers that you just mentioned, so thank you for this. I have uh, first thanks for your very engaging and uh, energetic words. Two two questions. One, um, during the hackathon, it was noticed several times, uh, also by some of your colleagues, how agile and quick the Commission was able to put this up in in a matter of of, of three four weeks. Yeah. Um, how will you make sure? That's this agility, which clearly is the name of the game of the of the world in which we are, will remain. And that when this crisis, and we all hope, will be over, uh, the European Commission will will remain on that mode, uh, which is which is the new normal. And and my second question is, um, it's how are you putting priorities? You mentioned about a number of projects. I give you the example of of a priority where Europe should have been involved, which is. Uh, the tracking device. It makes okay. no sense to have all the countries individually. If we want to have a single market, this would be an amazing opportunity for the EU to develop a technology. Are you? How do you put priorities so that we are not just in thank quantity you. in numbers, but also in in real achievements? Andrew, thank, you, thank you for your insightful question. So maintaining agility and your how do you prioritize? Maria, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your questions, Andre, uh, on Hackathon. Uh, for me, what, what is important now? Uh, allow me just here to thank my team because I'm a very lucky commissioner. They organized in three weeks 
uh, a hackathon that normally uh, takes uh, months uh, to organize this. Uh, but what is important now is definitely not to stay at, at this level when we have amazing ideas, but what's happened after we already have some experiences. That's why during uh, the, the, the the announcement of the of the of the awards i already said it that now we are working very hardly with my team to have a marathon uh 22nd 25th of may in mm -hmm. order really to 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 help and to facilitate the meeting between the 100 best ideas and funders networks uh it, I, for me that's that's now now crucial to see what will be the final result of this of this experience because um, Europe is very good in, in ideas, in making prototypes, but we need really to, to strengthen our, our, for, uh, our role when the time is coming to commercialize, to deploy and to, to see the real application and the benefits for, for the society. Uh, and at the same time, it's very much linked to the European Innovation Council and the challenge. I already said that it's a huge ambition to have a one-stop shop, to have uh, our European Innovation Council as a unicorn factory. Yeah. But we, we know yeah. there is a lot, a lot of work behind that. We need, we need to do something, something about interoperability. We are talking about completely anonymized data that can be preserved for a very, very, a very short and fixed period. We need to respect our own rules, the GDPR, the e-privacy, the NIST directive, because without the trust of citizens, it will be quite difficult to use and to, to see the benefits of this kind of new technology. Maria, if I may and cut trust, a, it's yeah. Sorry, sorry to cut across you. I do apologize because I'm, I'm conscious I've got a, a ton of people lined up to ask a question, okay? But on that point that, that, that Andrea was asking, it's not about the, 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 uh, the issues, the, the morality or otherwise, or ethics of the tr tracing app. It's about the prioritization. How are, you, how are you forming the basis of creating priorities? Are you doing that in a crowdsourcing way? Who are you speaking to, to create the priorities as you move forward? But very briefly, if I may, because that was really at the heart of Andre's second question. Back to but you, Maria. What, what is priority? Our priorities now, it's really first to the health of our citizens. And that's okay. why when we take measures, it's, it's first to preserve the health of our citizens, after to preserve the capacities of our health systems, and uh, definitely to, to preserve the coordination for our next steps and not to repeat the errors at the beginning of this crisis. Okay, and I suppose I think what's, what people want is to have a more of a, uh, a citizen-thon where you're defining your priorities, perhaps, is what I'm hearing. We have our next speaker, or, or a contributor, um, a former European pr uh, Parliament President. Pat, where are you? Are you there? Good afternoon. Uh, good, good afternoon. afternoon. Please do introduce yourself. I've, I've done a bit of it. Welcome. Thank you very much indeed. I am a uh, former president of the European Parliament. My name is uh, Pat Cox. Currently, uh, among many things I do, I'm president of the John Monet Foundation for Europe. And it's a wonderful opportunity. I thank Friends of Europe and I thank you, and Madam Commissioner, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, I find what you've been talking about really fascinating and it's uh, on the button. This is the moment for these uh, COVID-19 conversations. I would like to turn very briefly, if I could, to the recovery question and to ask you two things to the extent that you know them or can tell them. The medium-term financial framework is really important because it gives you uh, the capacity to develop your uh, research and innovation programs and also the recovery plan. And recovery is one of the words in today's title. Indeed. What do you expect to find in the recovery plan and in the medium-term financial framework that will give you the resources to release the kind of capacity of which you speak in regard to European okay. science, research and, the, and innovation. And the second Thank question, the second, was that it? Was that, it. that Great, That's so it. it's a money question, Maria. How much money do you want? First, President, thank you very much for your questions. I think that the best tool that we have at our disposal, that we all know the rules, and that will continue to contribute for better cohesion between member states, it's the MFF. That's why, that's why now, for me, it's quite important that our leaders join words and action. Because during this, this, this crisis, we all have seen what is the role of research, innovation, education, and culture. That's why I stay very firm since the very beginning 
since September uh, last year, that we need to have a strong Horizon Europe program. Because in our Horizon Europe program, we have all this. We have proposals for increased budget for Horizon Europe, for Erasmus Plus, for Creative Europe. The chance is by paying attention to them and a place for cultural tourism because 40% of the entire tourism sector is cultural tourism because three out of four Europeans are chosen their holidays destination taking into consideration the cultural heritage so okay. my my plea here is let's let's show that we have some lessons learned during sure. this crisis yeah and this, this time let's not take so much time uh, to to show that again that's refreshing of course again that's refreshing but you know that politics is at play and you possibly can't see to my answer the answer to my question is actually are you confident because what we've seen in the debate around the mff has not been that um collegiate but think about that as we come back to the end of the conversation we have uh daria and then malcolm can i ask both of you to come in hello please do introduce yourself hi my name is daria and i'm from ireland and um Many of you may know what kind of context of my question will be. I'm going to ask about something that is near and dear to my heart, that doesn't let me sleep at night, makes me awake every day and run through the day with motivation to change the world of education. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, um, I'm uh, owning a startup, um, which is about uh, three years old. And this startup is introducing emerging technologies for educational sector in K-12. So uh, my question is the following. Um, I'm observing, obviously, the industry of education constantly, and um, I have found out that many schools were not absolutely ready to change for digital, for e-learning, or introduce any technology at all. Okay. The best example would be my kids' school. So my question is, yeah. um, is there any plan or any priority for the European Commission to have uh, technology pushed as a must, must in the educational sector to make sure that for the next time if something similar happens um, that schools are ready and kids will not be losing their time sitting at home and trying to do something on their own. Daria, thank you for your question. You're also a European young leader and I suppose I'm not going to take away from your question the fact that the EU will say we don't have co you know, edu competence for education but that shouldn't stop action at an EU-wide level and that's not to answer your question Maria because I know that you have a response to that. Malcolm, can I bring you in too please? Malcolm, where are you? Hi, Demetra. Hello, you welcome. Here. Please introduce yourself. Uh, yes, so uh, thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, I'm Malcolm Byrne. I'm a member of the Irish Senate, but uh, until recently I worked in higher education policy uh, here in Ireland. I'm very conscious that normally at this time of the year we'd be having the Eurovision Song Contest. So I have to compliment you, Demetra, that, that the way that you're calling in uh, the juries from all over Europe, but the... Uh, the fact that you've now called a, a third Irish speaker in a row uh, <laughs> is interesting. Um, but, um, Commissioner, my, my question is, in the context of what's happening at the moment with the COVID-19 challenge, and lots of sectors are being uh, impacted, um, but the university sector uh, is going to be very heavily impacted in terms of revenue. And a lot of the work uh, that universities rely on are cross-border cl collaboration. You also have responsibility, as you mentioned, for the Erasmus Plus uh, program. But as it's unlikely that we're going to see uh, a lot of international travel, uh, how do you envisage um, cross-border research, plus the future of Erasmus, uh, while we continue to wait uh, for a vaccine that will allow people to travel with more confidence. Okay, thank you very much, Malcolm. Maria, over, back over to you. Um, two interesting, bold questions. Thank you. First, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Daria. Uh, yes, definitely. And the answer is uh, the Digital Education Action Plan. Uh, as I already said it, together with, with my team, we are working in order to present this plan by the end of June or first week of July. And believe me, uh, this, this work is quite 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 uh, hard because on one side in this updated version of the digital education action plan we would like to continue to build to some of our most successful initiatives or the previous one but definitely today this crisis has shown us how important it is to, to continue to insist on online quality content platforms do you know that um, the first 
five mock platform are not European. So for me, that's something we, we, we should do something. And I think that what you are doing, you can help us. We need to continue with trainings for teachers and for pupils. We need to continue in order to have better connectivity. That's why I will propose a new initiative, Connectivities for Schools. And I will use my previous experience as Digital Commissioner with our initiative Wi-Fi for EU. At the same time, definitely this, this period has shown us how important are virtual exchanges. By the way, we started to receive the first data and we can see an amazing increase mm -hmm. with a lot of new forms of interactions so now that was initially planned to have it in the next Erasmus Plus program, but we, 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 we can be sure that we need this very delicate balance. On one side, distance learning, there is definitely some very positive sides. On the other side, there is something uncomparable in this face-to-face -face and people-to-people -people contact. So we need to preserve this very delicate balance. On the role of universities, allow me first to say that universities were amazing during this crisis and they continue to be mm -hmm. because they have shown a lot of flexibility for their for their students. We started to receive some first figures because I ask our national agencies to report now every week what's happened on the ground. And for example, when we talk about universities and Erasmus Plus, we know that 70% uh, of our students for long-term mobility has inter have interrupted their mobility, but 30% continue. At the same time, when we talk about short-term mobility, universities, mm. European university alliances that can be and that will be the United States. Indeed, indeed. And I suppose, Daria, I heard that was an invitation, by the way, so you might want to know, note that in terms of... The... Barakat, hi. Barakat, I'm, um, my apologies. I... No worries whatsoever. No, that's please no please do introduce yourself. Yes, so my name is Christian Barakat and I do seen, but I'm wondering what are we going to do to be ready in the context of international competition? So I stop there. Sorry. Christian, if I may. The, the product of that research can be can be brought to market quickly, um, where you have the, 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 the right that I'm afraid that we need. Medicine initiative with pharmaceutical industry and they are, they are very, very, very engaged. And during this crisis, that was quite obvious that we need to invest in some, in some segments of the value chain that are in Europe, they don't have beauty to build something which is predictable, uh, where we can see for our needs. But with, uh, forgive my in intrusion there, but it needs leadership, it needs coaxing. And uh, thank you, Commissioner, for, for, uh, for your insights. I'm, I'm bringing you a little involved in science, so art and science, to bring us to back to society in our research so that we can deal with the cultural blue kind of so that society Lovely. becomes more resilient and can take up the research that thank time. you for bringing that dimension in that very much very much appreciated i'm also now going to go to our next uh, person who had their hand up and again is uh, the commissioner mentioned that you would hope to see uh, research reinforced in the upcoming uh, eu budget and i just wonder does reinforced mean more money for research or does does it mean saving research from budget cuts lovely good question thank you, thank you very much maria so how do we bring that uh, that beautiful thing about art and culture um into the heart of what we see as an economic recovery because most people don't make that connection uh, yet it can be the life lifeline for so many because this, this sector is very close to my heart because yes. uh, it's it's very obvious that creative europe it's not not enough that's why I, I said it, I'm like a commissioner, that I have research innovation on, in my portfolio. And when we talk about artists and culture, there is two opportunities. Mm. Cluster two in the New Horizon Europe program with culture, definitely research is, is here. And I'm sure that they, they will show us amazing things. Second thing with EIT, the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, a new kick will be created in 2022. So for me, what is important now is to build synergies. It's really to see how we can reinvent some of the most traditional forms, but at the same time, to pay attention to people that are working in these fields because they, they need jobs, they mm -hmm. need to have revenues. And online content, new forms, innovations, and uh, other business models, they, they, they should be there in order to help them. So um, on EANA, um, yes, is reinforcing simply 
protecting the budget from cuts or are you thinking of increasing? I already answered. I answered in one word, more. Lovely. So we all heard that, okay? So when, when, the, when the deal pans out, you know you are here. But uh, let's, see if, uh, let's hope politics is good to you in that and for all of us, because you know, your approach is refreshing. I have two more, um, and I'm, I'm conscious of time. I have Camilla, Camilla Sultanova. Uh, hello uh, from Finland, and uh, thank you um, for, for allowing to ask the question. Um, I work with young people and also minority groups, including international students in Finland. And uh, with this crisis, everything becomes moved and all the deep-seated issues that, you know, people, representation at work, representation in art, in politics. So how would you, with your uh, portfolio, which is so important, um, make sure that uh, they do, ahead of European Day is soon, um, they will trust the European promise. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Camilla, for that question. Um, I'm going to, so when you think about that, I think the most important thing is how do you create an inclusive process? So you don't just get the Erasmus Plus shiny faces along there, but some of the people from the poorest neighborhoods with the least educational opportunities to be part of that dialogue if you're planning one. Secondly, yeah. let's move to Julia. Julia Rober, where are you, Julia? Hello. You need to unmute, Julia. Here I am. Hello, everyone. My name is Julia from the city of Amsterdam. Thank you for this conversation. Um, my question is about the local dimension of EU research towards the recovery uh, uh, of the corona crisis. How do you think we can make sure that the EU research will be of benefit to cities and vice versa? How can cities contribute to the EU research in this crisis? Lovely. Thank you very much. Maria, back to you. Maria? Okay, first of all, uh, Camila, thank you. Thank you very much. When we talk about minority groups, we are talking about citizens. So that's that's always my, my main message. When when that was my, my video conference with, with ministers of education, and, and I, I already raised this issue. But that's why at the beginning I insisted on the creation of this platform where member states can exchange practices. Because talking about minority groups, all our member states, they have at their disposal the use now with the maximum flexibility of the Corona Response Investment Initiative or structural funds, and they can use European Social Fund, for example. They can use, use European Regional Development Fund. So now I give them some time because some of the first reactions it was, but we don't have examples, we don't have good practices. So definitely that will be one of the next steps. Okay, let's take thought what was done. Where, where we can find those best practices and how we can use them in all our member states. That will, will be definitely one of the questions because we can't continue to insist uh, on this question of digital skills education if we don't talk about inclusiveness. Indeed. No one should be left behind sure. because we can't build a resilient society without everybody because there is a potential everywhere and in everyone. And Maria, and Maria, before dimension, you go into the local dimension, yes. can, I just, can I just just interrupt you for a second? When you're thinking about answering that question, one of the issues for us, and we've produced this a paper called New Alu Localism, where we believe that uh, Europe would be better served if it actually used the intelligence at a local level to be involved in the thinking about policy development and policy, not necessarily the decision making, but actually use the intelligence at a local level, a city level, to engage directly in actually providing the intelligence of what's happening now, but also what's on the horizon and I think one of the issues you know as, as our colleague from uh, Amsterdam raises how do we m make sure we do that but also how does your portfolio dovetail with um, uh, Commissioner Sucha who's looking at the future of the conference of you uh, conference of the future of Europe the two need to surely be connected in this regard both the localism agenda and what the future is about oh, back to you Maria well, first, we are working extremely well together with Dubravka Shulica. She's doing a very, very good work. But I can, I can give you some, some examples because this local dimension for it's important because by definition, innovation is local. So it's time now to recognize it and to work in more concrete terms. When we talk about missions, the newest element in Horizon Europe, what, what is a mission? Mission is a portfolio of actions that they need to be filled by, by our citizens that there is a difference in their everyday life because action was taken at European level. Mission on cancer, I think that we are all concerned about this. We have people around us. Mission about the quality of food and the quality of water. 
smart cities we are living in. So that's why, for example, during my previous meeting with the chairs of the five missions, that was my main message. Please, at the beginning, include citizens because it's important that they feel that these missions are their missions because Indeed. that have benefits in their daily lives. We are talking about European Innovation with the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. That's why I insist to have a regional initiative to, to really to build some capacities in some parts of Europe where we don't have enough enough level of excellence. Let's be very, very honest about this. Research innovation divide is a reality in Europe. We need now to strengthen our capacities everywhere in all regions. And that's why I'm, I'm very much engaged in this. Final point, GRC, smart specialization strategies. Hmm. That's an example how we can take into consideration the local specificities to identify the real sectors and segments of the social uh, economic uh, life that we can build together a better sustainable economic development or social development. So you, you can see uh, under my portfolio, there is a lot of different initiatives. Now, as I said it at the beginning, the huge challenge is this time not only to talk about synergies, but to transform them into concrete actions. And it's not obvious, it's not an easy task. And second, when we talk about research, innovation, we need really to do this at the beginning, not for citizens, with the citizens. Mm. Excellent statement, Maria. Everyone's going to be saying, yay, wonderful. But I think there is always a but, isn't there? Is that you're, the institution you are at the heart of and leading as a, as a college is not known for its agility, its ability to move to the local and then back up again. And I suppose one of the things is that how do we keep that entrepreneurial po political uh, development that you're uh, describing as a commissioner and make sure that, ironically, it becomes infectious across the college, but also across the structure of a commission that's not level for all communities rather than just some, because otherwise we won't get the cultural tourism that we need in terms of the Green Deal. So tell me, what's your sense of how do we maintain that sense of pace, urgency, agility and moving both into Europe and back up in terms of the decision making process? A tough question, but a nice one to end off. Maria, the floor is yours. Yes, of course, I think that we need uh, really to, to keep uh, our priorities, Green Deal, digitalization. But to say that thanks to research, innovation, education and culture, we can achieve our objectives in a better way. What a Green Deal without our partnership on hydrogen and a lot of other, a lot of other examples. What's about the digitalization without digital skills, equip people, Talk about reskilling, upskilling, the role of uh, SMEs and startups in, in this education mm. process. So for me, what is important now, yeah. it's really to understand that for many years, we talked about the knowledge triangle, research, innovation, and education. I think that this crisis again has shown us how important is the knowledge square, service for the society. So that's for now my, my wish that we should continue definitely to preserve our strategic priorities. We need to work, but thanks to this knowledge square, we can really see how important is the contribution of the different components of the square. And it's time, it's time to recognize it because research, innovation, education and culture are here for our society. If you'd like to continue to lead our spirit, to be innovative, to be a leaders, to be leaders, definitely there is only one way. Indeed, Maria, that was a very good response, and I'm not going to untake away from it at all because that's exactly what I want to hear. But you've ducked my political, po the politics of my question is about how do you make sure at the commission level you're able to lead the process through the system? You don't have to answer it, but it's just something I think for all of us takes forever in people's eyes. So there's something there about the learning we need to take forward. But I'll leave you to say any final word rather than pressing you too much, and then I'll conclude. It's a teamwork. Every one of us has a role to play. Indeed. And every one of us is important. Absolutely. That's, that's the way we can achieve our goals. 
I agree with you. Of course we do. I'm not going to press you on the politics. I understand. I understand. But thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. This has been a really effective dialogue. I hope those of you who've been on Zoom and on live stream have enjoyed it and found it effective, useful, engaging. Um, keep tuned in onto our website. Uh, we have a number of uh, these kind of conversations. As I said, next week, I'll be in conversation with Didier Reinders. Uh, another commissioner. Uh, it's on our website. Do join us if you have the time. And again, thank you all very much. And have, be safe, uh, sound, and have a lovely rest of the week and mind your distance. See you all. And thank you, Maria. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>